now that we've talked about amino acids, we can now talk about what happens when amino acids come together, and these are going to form peptides or proteins. So peptides and proteins are really kind of synonymous. Proteins are larger molecules. Peptides are smaller. So um, your book identifies peptides as whenever you have 40 or fewer um, amino acids coming together in, pep in proteins whenever you have 40 or more. Um, so here the slide says peptides and proteins are formed when amino acids are joined together by blank bonds. So the question is, is what kind of bond do you see right there, right? And you should be able to identify that as an amide bond, right? Whenever you have a C double bonded to O bonded to N, right? That's like an amide functional group. So you can consider that an amide bond. And in particular, whenever it's an amide bond that linked together amino acids like this, we can call it a peptide bond, all right? So you could refer to that bond as either an amide linkage or an amide bond or a peptide bond, and both of those would be right. All right, so polypeptides have um, many amino acids. Proteins have more than 40. So you can see here, here's an example of a tripeptide, right? So again, if you're looking and trying to break this down into the individual pieces, there's one, there's two, and there's three. So that repeating unit for your um, amino acid is that NH3 plus CH with an R group, C double bond O, then NH, CH with an R group, C double bond O, NH, CH with an R group, C double bond O. And then on the ends of your peptides, right, you're going to have the amine group, and then you're going to have kind of the carboxylic acid group. So whenever you look at your amine group, what, no matter how many peptides you have together, so here's an example of three peptides linked together. You could have 50 peptides linked together and it wouldn't matter. On the left side of this, you're always going to have a free amine group where you have that NH3+, right? So that you're only going to have one side that has this NH3 plus on it. We call this the N-terminus, right? There's one side of your peptide that's going to have this free nitrogen kind of hanging out there. And I say free nitrogen. It's nitrogen with those hydrogens, that NH3+. That's your N-terminus. And then on the other side, on the right side of the molecule, you're going to have your C-terminus. And the C-terminus is where you have the carboxylic acid or your COO minus group. Right? Now, in the middle of all those, you're going to have that repeating unit that is NH. CH with an R group, C double bond O. So even if you had, like I said, 50 or 100 or 1,000 peptides linked together, you're going to have one N terminus, you're going to have one C terminus, then in between that, you're going to have those repeating units of NH, CH with an R group, C double bond O. And again, the R groups are always going to vary depending on the individual amino acids, but that repeating general structure will always be the same. Okay, so how do two am amino acids come together? Like, what's the chemistry that brings them together? Well, you can see in this slide here, if you have an alanine reacting with a serine, um, it really has doesn't matter what the individual amino acids are because the CH3 for the alanine and the CH2OH for the serine really aren't doing anything here. But the parts that are doing something is this carboxylic acid group. This is the COO minus here. And this is going to be the amine group or the NH3 plus group here. So those two come together and you form water, right? You form H2O over here. You can see the H2O in red kind of on the slide. Those two come together. Water is removed and you basically form that new amide bond that links um, the carbon with the nitrogen. So you're taking this carbon and you're linking it to that nitrogen to form the bond. All right, so that is how you form the new amide bond or the new peptide bond. So whenever you have a dipeptide or a tripeptide or however many free peptide or however many peptides there are, the N-terminal amino acid is always going to be on the left with your NH3 group. The C-terminal amino acid is going to be on the right with the free COO minus. So in this case, if you were looking at a combination of alanine and serine, um, and if I said, which amino acid is the N-terminal amino acid, you would say, okay, 
the N terminal amino acid is going to be this amino acid that is has that free NH3 group on the left. You would say, okay, what amino acid has CH3 right there as an R group? And you would say that's alanine. And then similarly on the other side, if you were to say, what is the C terminal amino acid? You would say, okay, well, there's my C terminus because that's where I have my free um, C double bonded to O bonded to O, right? The free carboxylic acid group. And you would say, okay, what's the R group attached to that one? Well, in this case, it's CH2OH. You could look it up on your um, formula sheet and say, okay, that one is a serine, All right? So that's how you would kind of um, look at problems like that. So here's another example looking at a peptide. So again, this peptide has three amino acids. The first amino acid, right, NH3, CH, C double bond O, NH, CH, C double bond O, and then NH, CH, C double bond O. So if I were to ask you, like, what is the N-terminal amino acid of this peptide? Well, you would first say, okay, the N-terminus is the one that's on the left. It has the free NH3+. plus. So then you would identify the N-terminal amino acid by looking at the side chain, which is going to be this part here. And you would say that the N-terminal amino acid, so the N-terminal is going to be glutamine in this case, or GLN is the abbreviation for glutamine. And you could identify um, the middle one, right, the same way you would look at this, this chain. You could say that one's going to be arginine. And then you could look at the one on the left, which is also going to be the C-terminal amino acid, and say that that one is going to be a methionine, MET, and that would be your C-terminal one. All right, so this peptide would be glutamine, arginine, methionine. Um, and I could also ask you a question like this. So what is the most likely pH that this peptide is found at given the charges. And if I were to say, is it going to be at pH 1, pH 7, or pH 14, right? So you could look at it and say, well, at pH 1, it's going to be really acidic. Well, if you looked over here at your carboxylic acid group, right, at your C-terminal group, well, at pH 1, that should be COOH, so it can't be at pH 1, all right? Well, could this be correct at pH 14? Well, no, because at pH 14, we know that at pH 14, the amine group, right, pH 14 is very basic. So we know that our amine group at pH 14 should be in the NH2 state, so, so it should not be protonated. So this cannot be true at pH 14 either. So that means the only one left would be at pH 7. So again, for pH 7, um, for pH 7, you always want to look and say, okay, if this is charged and that is charged, you're generally always looking at pH 7.